Cover the genre of hard rock and heavy metal. This is the Hard Rockology Show. I'm your host, Chris, and I'm joined by my co-host, Matt. Hey, Chris. All right, and on the show today, we got from the band Cobra and the Lotus, lead singer Cobra Page. Cobra, welcome to the Hard Rockology Show. Hey, you guys. Thanks so much for having me. I love the name of this show. Yeah, no one's ever asked us about our name of our show, which is really interesting, because my wife actually... We were brainstorming one night, and she came up with School Rock, and I said, well, that's kind of like the movie. And then she said, well, how about Hard Rockology? And I go, wow, that sounds pretty cool, and it stuck. So that's 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 the, the story behind Hard Rockology's name. That's awesome. Well, I love it. I think it's one of the, the best uh, show names I've seen, actually, in a while. Well, thanks. We appreciate it. And uh, Cobra, I want to say thanks for joining us here on the show. I've been a big fan of yours since the uh, second album. And I have to say, having had a chance to to listen to the brand new album, Prevail One, uh, this is probably, in my opinion, the best uh, material that you guys have put out so far. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. I definitely feel like a I have not felt as proud of something that we've done um, in a long time. Uh, I mean, I'm always, always proud of the album, but this was just another level of pushing ourselves out there. Now, one of the things, reading the bio on the album and all that, and this is something that usually doesn't happen with a lot of bands nowadays, is a lot of albums aren't actually written any longer uh, with the whole band in the studio. I know you guys went, went over to Europe and recorded the album over there, And you guys actually had the entire band there. Is that one of the reasons why this album is so, from start to finish, it's a a solid album? Was it the writing process? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it um, it is completely different from all the ways that all the other albums were written. And like you said, I don't think that this is something that happens all the time, especially now that things are so uh capably sent digitally um so fast and easily and that's that's great as well but i really wanted to cultivate something different something that i had noticed was inside the music uh when we were recording that classic uh rocky p cover and it happened it really did cultivate some magic in a completely different way when we were all in that studio bouncing ideas off each other listening to things uh it was incredible how it unfolded was the writing process a lot different with the uh, the previous records than this one? It was. Every single record has had so much variety in terms of songwriting. Um, if we compare High Priestess, for instance, there is like a, the first song, High Priestess, which I wrote, um, and that just happened, you know, with Guitar Pro. Uh, I tabbed it out, and that's how that one was written. And then there's Soldier and Hold On, which are songs that essentially Yasho had riffs and then I just uh, I loved them and sang over them and it turned into that collaboration Lost in the Shadows where we filled he had some uh, music for the chorus and then um, I just filled in music for the verses and then we built it from there together Uh, our producer Johnny um, me and him wrote Battle of Wrath the music and lyrics and did that together in the studio while the guys were recording downstairs War Horse was made by me, Johnny, and Yasho in the studio together. Um, it, it, so it was like a really, it's such an eclectic uh, collection of songwriting. And then this time around, it was just not like that at all. Um, first of all, I didn't I didn't write any music on this. I was the first time I surrendered all the music writing to the guys and uh, focused only on the vocals and... Uh, uh, they just went to town on the music. I was always in the room while we were songwriting, though, you know, just like because we were all in there saying like this. I don't think it's strong enough or this needs to elevate to a new place with energy or maybe this riff needs to be faster or something like that. So I was still in there uh, very actively while we were writing all the music for that first month. And uh, also we were establishing a sound for which direction we were taking the evolution, which was the biggest challenge. And that was mostly um, myself, Yasho, uh, Jacob Hansen, our producer, and a Danish songwriter named Martin Pegard Wolf. And the four of us really honed in for the first two weeks, transforming some of the, the sounds that we were going to focus on making. And yeah, it opened it up for a whole new range of expressing 
our our capacities too. I got to use more of my vocal range, which inspired me to use more dynamics in my voice. It was just uh, crazy. It started a domino effect once we finally got a grip on which way we were going. Now, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned Jacob Hansen and Ted Jensen, and I know you've done a lot of European tours with bands such as Amarith, Delane, and what I would say a lot of the symphonic type metal that's uh, prevalent over there in Europe. And one of the things I noticed about the new album is it seems like you've incorporated a little bit of that uh, symphonic, uh, melodic type of uh, stylings to the uh, the new material, and vocally-wise as well, too. I even noticed that your voice uh, is somewhat different in some of the tracks. Was that something consciously that you guys wanted to go in a direction, or was that just working with uh, Jacob Hansen and Ted Jensen to get that sound? Uh, no, um, it wasn't working with Jacob or Ted that actually influenced it at all. Um, I mean, I was initially drawn to Jacob because I loved the mix for Volbeat's records that had been coming out. That was actually how I found Jacob. Uh, and I was just like, man, this sounds so clear and I can hear everything. I want to investigate who's doing this. And, uh, Jacob was pretty hands off when it came to songwriting. He he didn't write music with us. Um, the symphonic uh, aspects and the sonic aspects and stuff, that's actually just uh, authentic pieces that are really directly inside me and Yasho, and we just weren't ready to express them yet, especially for me. I don't, I'm sure he was ready, but I, uh, I was not ready to be as vulnerable in my music, but now I am, and I just really wanted to show everything that I am on this album. And so that's actually how it happened. I think it just had a lot to do with just growing up as a person. Yeah, I do. I do like this, the sound of the, of the Volbeat albums. I wanted to ask you, like I always like to ask the musicians, uh, the album cover, it's a medallion on it, I believe. And, uh, mm. what did the, uh, mm-hmm. where did the, uh, the name of the album prevail one? Cause I, I'm guessing, I, which in fact I do know, there's going to be a prevail too. So tell us a little bit about the title of the album and, and obviously the album cover, which I always think is like a, a big part of of marketing. And I mean, I don't know if a lot of bands really put a lot of thought in it or they do, but uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always put a lot of thought into the album art. Uh, and this Mandela was specifically chosen because I wanted it to represent a human at the start of its life when it hasn't been influenced or experienced things in its life and there's no bruises, there's no cuts, there's no tough skin, there's uh, just this purity and innocence and beauty in a way that is undeniable to people. You know, when you see a baby, it's just, it's like, it's completely an untarnished thing and uh, that's what I think is the the beginning of every person and so that's what that Mandela represents and I thought it was just really appropriate because we as you said we've we've called the albums prevail one and two and Brad actually our bass player he came up with that idea um because I was really (laughs) I was really in this ambitious mode where I'm like we're going to really make a statement that we are not going anywhere and we intend to stay in this for the long haul. And we're going to, you know, uh, put out two albums. And he was just like, yeah, he's like, let's call it prevail. Cause that's what we're doing. We're prevailing on. And I was like, we are so prevailing on that is perfect. That's perfect for everything. And then it was perfect for the actual kind of general theme of both albums, which, um, all has to do with the human experience. And this is also the most relatable music in terms of clarity in the words that we have. It's less storytelling and more direct explanations or expressions of, uh, feelings or emotions or things that, uh, I was going through or seeing people going through, um, that hopefully they could take their own story into it. Yeah, one song on the on the record particularly stood out for me. It's called Hell on Earth. Uh, and, uh-huh. I, and, and I love the lyric. Um, I was talking to my brother about it last night. It's like when you when you say, I like the taste of my own blood. I mean, can you touch on that song a little bit? Tell us a little bit about <laughs> yeah. what that song actually is about. Because we were looking at the lyrics before we came on air with you. And uh, it's always interesting to maybe hear a musician's point of view on it. But sometimes maybe things are better left on. Un- on, um, uninterpreted, I guess that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, I think everyone should take their own thing away from it and, uh, 
it's great if they can, but Hell on Earth was definitely inspired by, um, uh, like, a, a struggle to actually figure out how to understand mental illness, someone going through mental illness and their actions. And if bad actions were acceptable uh, because of the state that they were in or the obstacles that they were facing. And that's really what it came down to, not being able to help someone that doesn't want to help themselves. And so you can hear all that things, like uh, all the things, yeah, um, you you know, you think you can help me, but I'm addicted to my own disease. You you can't help me. Yeah, and, uh, and you could also, I didn't want to, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I just wanted to interject. Okay. I think uh, you can hear a lot of the emotion and the way you sing in that song too, about actually what you're, what, what the, the theme, um, you're, the person you're singing about, or whether it's yourself or anybody else, is is going through. It's really, it's really done Absolutely. quite well. Oh, thank you. There's a lot of emotion in these songs. There's a lot of dynamics in these songs, also because I was just really, really expressing a lot of uh, real feelings for myself. And Hell on Earth, like you said, even if it's, um, even if it was written about someone else, uh, after I wrote all these songs, actually, I really saw a reflection of myself and everything too. I mean, I can do that. I can, uh, completely, um, well, we can all be our own worst enemy as that saying goes. And so, uh, it's easy to enjoy the taste of your own blood, you know, um, a little too easy if you let your brain go too far. Exactly. Great song, though. I just wanted to bring that up. So it, thank you. It, 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 that that song in itself is is worth buying the entire album. But we'll touch on some of the other songs, right, Matt? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and touch on some of the other songs right now. You've already released three singles from the album: the opening track, Gotham, then Trigger Pulse, and in my opinion, probably the most unique song that I think you guys have done so far to this point. You don't know. Was there a reason behind the release of those singles, a particular order, or is that just the way the, the luck of the draw? And uh, can you talk a little bit about those three tracks? Yeah, uh, Trigger Pulse was just uh, one of those songs where I had a feeling about it. I just thought this is the song that we should put out there first because it had this new um, sonic evolution inside it, but it also didn't let go of everything we've done before. It was still heavy as hell. But uh, yeah, I had this... I, I, it was just kind of that new introduction and I thought it was the best way to introduce it. So that's why we released trigger pulse first. And crazy enough, that actually was uh, still like the most um, played song that we've had to date above even all the ones in the past. Uh, it just has been playing like crazy. So I think it was kind of a, a good move for us there. And uh, then Gotham, we had released after that because uh, that was really a half and half thing where it had, um, all the old sound and it had all the new elements of Cobra and the Lotus together and you still got your guitar solos and everything. And I thought that that was going to be super important, especially for the supporters that we already had to just show that that was still not going anywhere and not to worry about the new stuff. Cause I think that, uh, can be alarming, you know, to hear a shift for some people sometimes. And, uh, yeah, that's why we chose that one. And You Don't Know was actually picked by Napalm. And we are releasing a music video for that today and tomorrow. Uh, so after tomorrow, it will be available for everyone worldwide to see. And um, that was just, uh, oh, that was so fun. I think there couldn't have been a better song that we could have picked to do as a first video. Um I feel really passionate about that song. So, yeah, uh, that's that's how that happened. Um, in terms of the song orders on the albums, those just really came down to uh, always what do we think is going to be a good way to impact people off the first listen, and then how do we balance the the hard rock and the heavy metal uh, equally on Prevail one and two, you know, so for instance, hell on earth is on this one. So we put the other one that's right directly in that vein on the second one. And, uh, we just kept the, the blend of the music really equal on both albums, which is good. Cause then we didn't do a 180 on anybody. And we also, um, stayed authentic to ourselves and everyone can find something they like, hopefully on each album. Now, was that the intention? Cause that was one of the things I was going to ask you and you've already answered it partially is, 
when you start doing a shift in music style, which is just natural for most bands to sit there and evolve their sound, and you're going to get your your detractors out there. They're going to sit there and say, this doesn't sound like the old stuff anymore. What are they doing? I mean, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you answered the question that, yeah, you're going to keep a lot of the old element that is Cobra and the Lotus and incorporate some of the newer, I guess, influences and styles that you guys are evolving into. So, I mean, was that something that was consciously that you guys were aware of, that there's going to be people out there that may at times be uncomfortable maybe with the direction you may be going with? Yeah, uh, we were very conscious about it. And that was why, um, yeah, specifically why I I also, uh, when we had set out to, before we had even written the music, um, there was this intention to not not make it all completely new and transformed sounding because I just really, really didn't want to pull that turn so quickly on everyone that's been there for us. And uh, we needed to be happy. You know, as you said, it's a natural thing for artists to evolve. And I know for myself, I couldn't make another record like High Priestess because I needed to uh, express High Priestess and then some. You know what I mean? Like there was just so much more to me when it came around to... Uh, needing to make music out there it was like the the how people change in their lives you just need it and at the end of the day that's why we're doing music it's because we have this passion and this love and we can't let it go and uh so that was really important you know for our souls as well it seems like it seems like cobra that a lot of rock fans are always they're so passionate about their music and their and their favorite bands and stuff, but yet they can be so critical about every little thing a band does. I mean, we were just like, I, I pulled up uh, some of the videos of Cobra and the Lotus on, on YouTube. And do you guys actually like ever scroll through all the comments and see what people are saying about the video? I'm, I'm almost positive you do, but do you take it with a grain of salt and say, okay, I like the good stuff, but I don't like the bad stuff, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I actually try to steer away from YouTube because I find that that specifically is, um, never uh, like the best positive experience uh, for things like there, there are a lot of great comments on YouTube. Um, but there's also just some of the most ridiculous comments I've seen have showed up on that, uh, platform. So, uh, I don't personally try to look at YouTube very often, Uh, places where I do pay attention is like if people directly write on our wall, um, um, you know, or they, uh, or it's, it's writers like brave words, bloody knuckles or people like that. I mean, uh, if I look back at out of the pit, the very first album we ever released, um, it was Carl, the guy from brave words, bloody knuckles that told us that he wasn't going to write a review about our independent album because he thought it would just slam us in a way that would make it even harder for us to, um, get out there. And, uh, I really, uh, had to take a look at the reasons for why, because, um, um, I did need to, uh, evolve. The music needed to evolve. And that was actually, uh, when I wrote welcome to my funeral and that was just a song that I wrote. And I, I just like wanted to set a president precedent for, okay, we're going to, we're going to uh, go in this direction. And it used the full body of my voice. And then everyone picked up on, you know, from there and the band, um, the band was all over it and we got started going that way and just expecting more from ourselves, expecting better musicianship, expect, expecting better songwriting and starting that journey. And so that was constructive criticism. And I'm really grateful for that. And those are things that I do pay attention to sometimes because they've actually dramatically shifted how we move forward as a band. And I, and I needed to grow, um, and the band needed to grow. Um, but the, uh, others things like, you know, there's some rules that I just live by and that's like, don't read YouTube and don't read blabbermouth <laughs> comments, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, it is funny though because I mean it's like everybody that all these hard rock fans are like totally passionate about hard rock. They hate every other kind of music, but yet when a band of theirs puts an album out, all they do is just rag it, make fun of it, or some people like it, and then other people start attacking each other. But when you go to shows, yeah. every everybody's having a good time. But behind the scenes, it's like you said. I mean, it's just like everybody's got their opinion on it, and it's like yeah, we like some stuff and some stuff we don't like. 
you know? And it, yeah, it, it, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I see some comments, uh, for instance, um, on our wall when we released these singles, you know, when Trigger Pulse came out, there were some people that wrote, you know, where's the guitar solo? Because they know us for these dual lead guitars. And it's like, uh, well, it's going to be there. But there's also, you know, there's like we're also songwriters. And to us, there's more than just shredding sometimes. Like it can be tougher to write even a more simple sounding song than it can be to write like, um, like hell on earth is very natural for us by this point. You know what I mean? But it took like a lot of thought, uh, especially to really break out and write a song like trigger pulse, um, where we had to learn more, you know, about how to make it strong without all these, these things that we were, we built muscles and, in being able to write. And, uh, those are things that I, you know, I see. And I, of course, I, I pay mind a, a little bit to those things and just, but yeah, YouTube, like you said, it could be anyone passing by. It pops up in their search. They just feel like commenting because they can, and you don't have to see anyone face to face anymore. And it just gets really stupid quickly. But yeah, my brother and I were talking about what you just mentioned a second ago about the new album, and we were like, oh, well, man, it'd be cool if there was a little bit more guitar lead in it here and there. But I mean, I guess you've heard it from more than one person already. So it's like <laughs> maybe something to, to think about down the road. That's just my opinion, though. Yeah, you know, I mean, we tried to put a lot of uh, guitar in some places just just because we still appreciate and love it. But uh, at the same time, you know, like we can't make everyone happy. And we tried to find that balance um, for ourselves and for also everyone out there on these albums. And um, for right. me, like, I feel like we did a, we did our best job as we could with finding that happy medium. And Kobe, we've already talked about a couple tracks on the album and... You know, there's, there's got to be a couple tracks on the album that you're really proud of. So which two tracks? I mean, maybe the ones that have already been released or or maybe the yeah. ones we've already talked about. Do you have a couple tracks on there that you're really proud of that you want to talk about? Uh, I I mean, that's a tough one because I'm really, really proud of everything that's uh, on the album. But uh, I'm going to say, why not Trigger Pulse and You Don't Know? Just because those were... Those were really challenging for us to write and they took so much thought and there are so many micro details in that music that people probably won't even notice that uh, make the music move forward as the song goes on. And uh, there's also just an just uh, an introduction to also more tones in my voice and some cool guitar sounds like I love the James Bond uh, sound and you don't know that's just like one of my favorite things of the whole song <laughs> do, do, do. and uh those are like the little details that were just so fun so i'm gonna say i'm gonna say that just because for us as song like when we were writing them it was just uh we really had to stretch our box and they were very they were very thoughtful songs when they came together well i appreciate you sharing a little bit of that with us cobra and now here on the Hard Rockology Show, we always like to do a little cross promotion, and uh, your name just happened yeah. to come up with something that I wanted to touch base with you about. Last year, one of my favorite albums that came out last year was a band called Heaven Below. Good, yeah. mor Good Morning Apocalypse, and my favorite track on the album, Devilina and the Damage Done. I got to ask you about that song. How did how did you come about working with Patrick Kennison, who's a good friend of the show? And uh, because it's a great track, and I guess we could call you uh, Devilina, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know if you saw the pictures on Facebook. We were doing something for a music video, and I was wearing red contacts the other day. <laughs> so maybe I am Devilina. Um, that, was a, that was so fun and such a cool experience. Uh, it came about because we were playing with um, my friend Bones. We had had him joining us on tour um, in that period of time when we weren't looking to fill the drumming position per permanently. And, uh, he was friends with Patrick and he just said, Hey, um, I really think that you would do a good job at this. They're really interested. Uh, um, they really need a, like a favor by someone. And, uh, would you be into this? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I just, I just did it. I just recorded over here. Uh, y'all sure recorded my vocals for me and then I just sent them over it's a great track and and if people out there haven't had a chance to to hear that track definitely pick up the uh, Heaven Below album and uh, it, it's it's 
Good you know, Morning Apocalypse, right? Yeah, Good Morning Apocalypse. It's just a, a good song to add to the uh, Cobra and Lotus catalog. If you haven't heard, definitely pick it up. Yeah, it's, it was super cool. Super cool to be involved in. Okay, so you got the album. It's coming out in a couple of weeks. And uh, what's the what's the plans for the rest of 2016 or 2017 now? I mean, we're already in 2017, halfway through. Uh, are you guys going to be on tour a lot? What's going on with that? Um, yeah, we're uh, going on tour very soon. Uh, with Xandria and One's Human through North America. Then after that, we we will head over to Europe. Um, we're going to do a couple festivals this summer, uh, four in Europe, one in the States, actually. And uh, in between those gaps of time, we're going to be doing all the photos and music videos for Prevail 2 so that that stuff is wrapped up for uh, its launch. Um because I don't know when the specific date for that launch is now. Uh, Napalm is going to be a play a big role in setting that time for us, but we're we're needing to get prepared for all the other content. And then in the fall, we're planning on touring more, so we're working on some dates in the UK. Hopefully, we'll come through the states again. Um, really, that period of time from September to November is uh, is something that doesn't come together for us until like two months before it's just it's kind of how it goes it's also how it goes when you're at the mercy of still being in the support slot as a band most of the time um so i don't really know what's happening there but there will be touring happening and then december we're touring with beyond the black uh through germany only and that will be very exciting we've never done a german only tour and it's uh, quite extensive so that will wrap up that year. And then 2018, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be like this full-on Prevail 2 thing. And then we're going to have so much touring to do for two years. So is, is Prevail 2 already done too? It's just not released yet, right? Yeah, Prevail 2 was written at the exact uh, – Prevail 1 and 2 were never um, in an order when we had written the music. Okay. We just wrote a crap load of music for both albums. We wrote too much music, and then we picked all the strongest songs that we loved and um, believed in. And uh, then I basically separated them into two albums, and, and if everyone was okay with it, then they said yes, and um, that's how it – that's how it flowed. And Napalm actually let us pick the uh, order. They said, you guys can have the order of the, which was really cool. That That is the first time a label has actually not had their hand in choosing the, you know, the songs that go on each album. They said the order is very personal for an artist. So you guys go ahead. And uh, yeah, so it's been all finished at the same time, written at the same time. Um, it's crazy when you think about albums uh, when they release because usually the music was written for like a year or a year and a half ago, you know, prior to that at least. Um, that's kind of what's happening with especially Prevail 2. It'll have been, oh, like almost two years when that <laughs> album comes out from last spring. But it, is, but it is cool getting back-to-back albums two years in a row. I mean, a lot of times there's a lot of downtime between records nowadays at least back in the day a band will put out an album every single year but it's kind of cool that you have this one coming out in a couple of weeks and then prevail too lots of touring so i would recommend people if uh cobra and the lotus is not coming to your town you need to figure out how to get to a town that they are coming to and check them out and mm-hmm. check out the new album too it's called prevail one it should be out in a couple of weeks or by the time you hear this interview it'll be out I also wanted to ask you, Cobra, uh, like we do on Hard Rockology show all the time, we always ask the musicians if they have a Spinal Tap moment or moments that they would like to share with us. <laughs> uh, I think the the best Spinal Tap moment I can think of for us as a whole as a band um, was uh, actually when we were playing with Kiss and Def Leppard and opening for them in Denver. It was the first arena gig of the tour. Uh, so they were having trouble setting up Kiss's spider inside the arena because um, <laughs> we had, <laughs> yeah, because we were in the outdoor amphitheater, you know, before that. So it's like a different deal altogether, I'm sure, when you go into all these different shaped arenas and dome things. And uh, we were really pushed, like right till three minutes after we were supposed to start Def Leppard did not get their stuff off. And just because of the way that production had taken so long that day. So we 
uh, threw the amps up on stage. Like, um, that was how we got on stage. We skipped the intro. We, we jumped up there, um, started playing. And then, uh, we went 30 seconds over the set time because everything got pushed so far. And, uh, <laughs> we were all on in-ear system. So we couldn't hear that they had cut the sound in front of house. And so we kept playing like our hearts out and we're in the final song, but we were 30 minutes uh, in, you know, and, and uh, it got cut and we kept playing for 20 more seconds, full on, just running around the stage um, until finally like uh, Yasho had seen like someone signaling from his side. So he came over to me and was like, stop, you know, putting the hand at his neck, like cut it out. And I was like, oh shit. Like I pulled my in-ear out and of course there's nothing coming out there. And I'm like, oh holy crap our drummer was still playing full throttle through i am i am and uh i ran over to brad on the other side of the stage told him like stop and him and jake stopped then bones was still playing drums through that whole thing so uh we came up to him and we're like stop playing the drums and uh we actually got a standing ovation i think people felt bad for us or something uh because uh it was really comical i'm sure to witness like this band trying to like stop everyone playing on the stage and we have no idea for a while you know that there was nothing coming out yeah i would have just let him keep playing the drums that would have been funny you guys just all walk off the stage and just all leave yeah he's he's just playing drums but 30 seconds really they just cut the power for 30 seconds yeah they just cut it right off like no tolerance and um it's completely like i completely understand it. it like that that's just etiquette. We have never yeah, crossed over a set time ever, but it was just the circumstance and they, they let it go really easily because they knew that they had actually put us in um, like a really stressful position when we had started playing. And uh, so we moved on from it, but it was pretty funny. And then actually the crew uh, on the second last gig uh, that we were doing with them, the crew for Def Leppard, they came on stage during the last song again, during I Am I Am, and they started dismantling everything. So they took the monitor out from Brad's foot <laughs> and walked off the stage. They came and took like uh, the um, the toms away from Bones, and they came and started dismantling his cymbals. And so he was left with just like uh, one kick and the hi hat and the snare by the end of it, and the whole kit was missing. And they were they were bumping through us with their shoulders, like completely straight faced. And at first, like me and Yasha looked at each other and we're like, oh, shit. Like, did we go over time again or what the hell is happening? We'd never been pranked before, so we didn't actually know. We didn't clue in. And then we realized, like, this is a joke. And it was so funny. Oh, it was great. <laughs> they got us. They got us good. All right, Krobo, I want to thank you for uh, joining the Hard Rockology show. Matt and I, once again, thank you for uh, being part of this. And everybody, make sure you pick up Prevail 1 from Cobra and the Lotus. And as we do here on the Hard Rockology show, we always have the musician take us out of the interview by introducing one of the songs off their latest release. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, Let's go with Hell on Earth because it sounds like you guys love that one and I love it too. I can't wait to play that breakdown on stage. I just like the way she says she she likes to taste of her own blood. I just love that. I just like, I was just like listening to that for a while. That's like really (laughs) cool. 